Hi, my name is Nick Lemon. I'm the director of Columbia Global Reports and also a professor at Columbia Journalism School, where I'm sitting right now. Um, and I'm here to uh, moderate a discussion of Harriet Washington's new book, which we're publishing at Columbia Global Reports. It's called Carte Blanche, The Erosion of Medical Consent. If you haven't seen it, this is it. Um, we were supposed to have this evening opened by President Lee Bollinger, uh, but he got called away at the last minute on an urgent family matter. So he sends his profound regrets and I'll just uh, introduce the evening and then segue into being a moderator. Um, Columbia Global Reports is a five year old um, publishing venture at Columbia University. We publish short books on important topics that we think aren't getting discussed enough. Um, and we want to use these books to start a larger conversation of the kind that we're having right now. We've published, uh, by the end of the spring, we will have published 30 books on a very wide variety of subjects. Um, and we're extremely proud to be publishing this book by Harriet Washington. I'll introduce our three panelists and then start asking them questions. I've got questions that audience members who signed up in advance sent in, and um, I'll be reading from them as we get kind of closer to the end of our hour together. Um, so Harriet Washington, the author of Carte Blanche, is a, a prolific and veteran science and medical writer. Um, she's, uh, for all these people, I have a, a very long introduction that is earned by each of them and would take up the whole hour to read. So I'm going to give very, trust me, there's a lot more there. Um, Probably her best known uh, of her books is, is Medical Apartheid, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. Um, she's also, I feel constrained to say, a graduate of Columbia Journalism School. Um, Jelani Cobb, who is uh, sitting only a few feet for, away from me, though when he goes on the screen, it won't look that way, is uh, my fellow faculty member at Columbia Journalism School, as he has been since 2016. Um, he's a, trained as a historian, uh, works mostly as a journalist, mostly for The New Yorker, though also for Frontline, and, and he has appeared in many, many places on a wide variety of political, historical, and cultural topics. Um, Dr. Olajide Williams is a professor and chief of staff of the Department of Neurology at Columbia University Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons. So hi, everybody. Um, there's a lot to talk about. So um, I hope everybody will use this as reason to read the entire book. Um, and, and know that we're just getting a little ways into it, but I wanna get into it as much as we can. Um, Harriet, it might be useful to start uh, just by describing the kind of origin story of this book. What, um, what, what got you onto this topic? It's actually been an obsession of mine for a long time and it's hard to pinpoint exactly when I began to realize that informed consent, you know, that jewel of medical ethics promulgated by American doctors and lawyers after World War II was slowly being eroded. But certainly one of the things that opened my eyes was the polyheme study. Um, in 2003 to 2006, company began testing artificial blood. They had a patent on this artificial blood and they did it by having it carried on ambulances. So people who are trauma victims were met by an ambulance that instead of rushing to treat them, would first open a manila envelope, look at a computer printout to find out what to give the person, the standard of care or the artificial blood they were testing. And the publicity around it was all very laudatory, all very positive. This is cutting edge, new treatment. You're lucky to live in this area and to get it. But nobody who was given it had a chance to say yes or no, I want to be part of the study. And in the end, the data were tallied and found that people who received artificial blood were more likely to have a heart attack or die. Mm. 
So it was not beneficent. And um, that really shocked me. And what shocked me even more was the complicity, you know, the uh, indifference to a lot of medical ethicists toward that, you know, being acceptable and not questioning this. The more I looked at this phenomenon, the more troubled I became. I saw racial disparities in the way it was being carried out. I saw language being perverted, in my opinion, to um, confuse treatment and research and um, just really, you know, surprised and dismayed that there was less attention to pay to this. So that's where I, it came I, from. I remember more specifically, there was a laudatory article uh, sort of depicting a non-consent environment in an emergency room in Baltimore as right. a sort of example of medical heroism. And, and I think that pulls up a larger point. So, I, you know, I don't want to name names, but, but just to, you know, talk about how, you know, that old saying, one man's meat is another man's poison. Uh, one person's medical miracle treatment is another person's uh, lack of attention to consent. Could you talk about that a little? I'll be happy to. I'm not really averse to naming names, but um, <laughs> I don't think we really have to hear. Yes. Um, and it's really interesting because one of the issues here is the way language is used to portray experimental modalities as beneficent, as things that are going to help people, as treatment, as a matter of fact. But it's not treatment. It hasn't been tested. We're hoping that it will help people, but we don't know that it'll help people. Experimental. That's why we're doing the research, right? So in Maryland, what they were doing was they were um, promulgating this artificial, this um, inducing hypothermia, usually regarded as a medical emergency, in order to try to prolong the lives of gunshot victims. And they promoted it again as um, a cutting edge treatment that the people in Baltimore were lucky to be able to um, have offered to them. But um, it wasn't treatment, it was an experiment. It is an experiment. And um, you know, hypothermia is known to be fatal. It's usually treated as a said, medical emergency, but they were inducing it in people. And more than that, the article said they were, they were targeting black men, young black men. And that puzzled me because um, if being a gunshot wound victim were indeed um, a reason to be, uh, to be experimented upon in this manner, why would you target black men? There was vague language along the lines of, oh, well, they have high rates of gunshot wounds. It's true, it's America. We all have high rates of gunshot wounds. But when I looked into the data for 2016, I found that 9,000 white men had succumbed to gunshot wounds at that year, but only 6,000 white men. So if indeed it were a rationale for, this, for the experiment, they should have been recruiting white men, not black men. So there are a lot of troubling things here, you know, a lot of um, um, suggestions that simply are not so. It's simply not the case that hypothermia is known to be efficacious and safe. It's simply not the case that black, there's a case to be made for black men because they have higher rates of gunshot wounds. So. Um, you know, very often when you see something at, presented as um, possibly beneficent, possibly harmful, I, I look at the beneficence and I often see not that, but I see semantics, you know, being used to present something as helpful when really there's very little evidence of that. And that's what I saw there. It's a feature of a lot of the studies I write about. Um, Jelani, I wanna go to you um, for, I guess, you know, Harriet mentioned sort of targeting black men with that particular treatment, but that's not something that only happened once in Baltimore. And there's some history here. So could you talk about that history a little bit? Sure. I mean, you know, which is Harriet has done such a great job of laying all of this out um, in her, her previous work. But, you know, we can't really have a conversation about these uh, dynamics without talking about uh, context and history. And, you know, the fact that our bodies, not specifically Black men, but Black people, you know, our bodies would, were stolen, actually doubly stolen, were stolen in the institution of slavery, and then, you know, often purloined after death to serve as cadavers for medical schools. And so the, the tradition of medical knowledge coming at our expense uh, is a long one and a deep one. And you know, just in New York City, you know, we had this 
um, your kind of contentious debate about the monument to, to J. Marion Sims, the, the right. gynecologist, uh, which was on Fifth Avenue and you know, the non-consensual, there's a second monument to him, by the way, uh, outside the South Carolina State House. Uh, and so when there was the, uh, the issue of taking down the Confederate flag after the Emanuel AME uh, massacre, uh, I went to the Capitol grounds and saw that there was a monument to Strom Thurmond uh, a monument to Ben Tillman, who was a former governor who uh, bragged about having led lynching parties, a monument to J. Marion Sims. And I was like, oh, you can start with that flag, but you have a whole lot more to okay. do <laughs> before, before the day is over. Um, but nonetheless, you know, he did non-consensual medical experimentation on, on Black women, gynecological experiments. Uh, and so, and the, and the most well-known uh, is Tuskegee, you know, the experiment that went from the uh, 1930s into 1970 or so uh, of Black men who were infected with syphilis and were led to believe that they were being given treatment and, and were not, they were being observed. Uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's a, a gross metaphor, you know, for what our relationship to you know, many of these medical establishments have been. Uh, and uh, I, I think that when we talk about you know, the so-called vaccine hesitancy now or any of the other things. It, it, it's such a long, ugly history that it's impossible to parse out, you know, what happened then from how the attitudes that people have now. I, I just throw in a possibly relevant anecdote. Many years ago, three decades ago, I wrote a book about the development of SATs and other standardized tests. And so, you know, in, in trying to understand the differentials in scores by race, people would say, well, they have all these words in the questions like yacht and antique. So they did a study of what words, what question content produced the biggest racial difference. And what they found was, I don't know if this is still true, anything about medicine produced mm -hmm. these huge differences mm -hmm. between black and white respondents in how they answered the question indicating an entirely different consciousness by race about medical stuff. Can I add one quick thing in here about that? I, I interviewed the mayor of Newark, Raz Baraka, um, last year for a documentary about policing. Obviously, this was after George Floyd. This is after Breonna Taylor. There's a very clear reason why we're talking about this. And in the middle of that conversation, uh, he said something that was astounding and kind of stood, stayed with me. He said, uh, every year, there's more Black women who die in the maternity ward who than who die at the hands of the police. And he was saying that we're talking about one set of institutional relationships, uh, you know, relating to policing, he was, but the nefarious multiplier effect of our relationships at a medical establishment likely have as much impact as the criminal justice system does, if not more. Right, and now we're seeing a, um, a calculus of the two. You know, policing is now part of the problem in terms of medicine as well. The ketamine experiments were non-consensual mm. and Elijah McCain died after, um, he was given um, ketamine by ambulance attendants who often say the police urge them to give them medication. The, so I'm we sorry. need to reel that one back and start us with what's ketamine in the first place. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, ketamine is um, a very potent drug use in surgery. Uh, typically it's used to um, depress function and um, it's also got an re ugly reputation as a street drug. But um, the idea was it's now being explored for possible use as um, not only a sedative, but also to uh, treat depression and suicidality. And one way it's being done is by when people are agitated and the amnesty is called, attendants decide based on a scale of agitation whether to give the person ketamine or not in an attempt to calm them down and collecting the data as experimentation to see whether it works. Well. The problem with that has been that many of the people who are given ketamine after the scale shows they're, too, they're very agitated um, go into respiratory distress and wake up in the hospital the next day on a ventilator. Mm 
you know, it's a very, it's got a lot of side effects, a lot of adverse effects. And Elijah McCain, the headlines, you know, described how he died after the police were called, but he died from the ketamine he was given by ambulance attendants. It's part of a research study, but nobody asked the people's, you know, permission before they give him this experimental drug. Dr. Williams, um, let me ask you um, anything you know you want to observe about this topic. But what I'm particularly interested in is what what happens inside the sort of sociology, anthropology, and economics of the practice of medicine that creates pressures to you know cut corners or just ignore uh, consent procedures. Well, I have to say, I just want to thank Harriet for the wonderful book, because as a physician, it was really, really, um, really uh, engaging reading for so many reasons. Uh, she touched upon our world um, in a way that was, um, was, was very difficult to read, um, because it was, it was so raw and so real, uh, and it, it really encompassed all the human conflicts uh, and all the challenges that we face um, when working in a fundamentally uh, unjust system. You know, I have to say that the U.S. healthcare system by design is inequitable. You know, it was, it was based on an employee-based system. It's a profit-driven enterprise. Um, and so by design, uh, we are, we're dealing with the wrong incentives. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I also like what Jelani said about really comparing, you know, the, 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 the injustice in the police system with the injustice of, in the healthcare system, because, you know, it always reminds me of something Martin Luther King said. He said that of all the forms of inequality, that injustice in healthcare is, is the most shocking and inhumane. Uh, and, and we don't talk about it. And we don't talk about it because you know, the relationship people have with their physicians is a sacred relationship. You know, the, the, the vulnerability people have when they're sick um, is, is a, um, you know, is a difficult vulnerability to cast into the light of an, an, of an injustice. Uh, and so healthcare and providers, we, we have been almost shielded by the, 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 the position we hold in, in, in society. You know, there's what we call a, a, the power distance index, right? This is a, I've always found it very interesting. It's a measure uh, of acceptance of hierarchy of power uh, and, and wealth by individuals who make up uh, the general population. Um, and for example, you know, in the low power distance culture, uh, there's respect for individuality uh, versus respect uh, for authority in, in a high power distance culture. And, um, and, and one of the things that we know is that you know, is that, um, is that in among, you know, and the, these power distance uh, indexes reflect, you know, how much a society believes that inequalities among people um, are acceptable. You know, so, but, but what I, where I'm going with this is that, that, that I would argue that the relationship between a patient and a healthcare pro professional can be influenced by this power distance index. The patient doctor relationship is not on a level playing field. You know, and patients need to speak up and they need to be engaged and they need to be empowered uh, in order to utter concerns or, or preferences uh, to avoid disasters. So, so this power distance is a real barrier. Um, and in fact, it's been shown to be an inverse predictor uh, for patient empowerment. And, and I, I say this because um, when you think about uh, research and the way research is designed, um, it's filled with, with conflicts. It's filled with physician conflicts. You know, if I'm running a study, I'm responsible for recruiting the patients. I'm responsible for obtaining consent from the patients. And, 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 and in most situations, uh, if, you're on a, if, you, if, you're, if you're doing research as a physician, you're being funded by the research entity. It could be a pharmaceutical company, or it could be uh, the federal government, the NIH, the CDC, et cetera. And in these situations, a proportion of your salary is coming from this funding. And so your livelihood is dependent on this funding that you are receiving, which is also dependent on your research being successful. Now, bear in mind that if the research is not 
and, and bear in mind that there are monitors uh, and milestones. And these milestones are often related to recruitment. And so if, you're, if your milestones is related to recruitment and you know that the, that the funding funder is gonna do an interim analysis of your recruitment, you know, in a year from now to see how many people, how many black people have you in recruited? How many white people, how many women have you recruited? You know, how many people with X have you recruited? And these are the milestones. And so you are under tremendous pressure to meet these milestones. And remember what I said earlier, that we are responsible for obtaining consent. We are responsible for recruiting these individuals. And we are also responsible for meeting these milestones. So just look at the conflicts right there alone. And, and, and yes, there are, there are uh, we need to report disclosures in our conflict with conflict of interest uh, disclosure. That is a Columbia requirement. Uh, yes, there are the IRB is supposed to protect us uh, and protect rather protect patients. But the reality is that the, even the IRBs have challenging situations to deal with. Let me now. just in, interrupt for a sec I, for the uninitiated. IRB stands for in, Institutional Review Board. Yes, which approves uh, human subject experiments. Yes, and there's the ethics review boards, and that is supposed to protect patients. Uh, but what I loved about what Harriet talked about, and she spent a lot of time talking about IRB, and, and, and Harriet, you really got me thinking about my own research and my own approach, because one of the things she talked about was that, um, is that you know, we need to figure out a way um, to have independent education of research subjects, um, because when I'm recruiting a research subject, I educate that subject about the research topic, you know, I'm going to recruit you into the stroke st treatment study. I tell them what it's about, and I tell them what the benefits and what the risks are, and you can stop all the time. But the reality is, I still do have an unconscious or conflict of interest. And, and we know that these, these conflicts of interest, you know, they, they have a way of, of really creeping into our actions. You know, it's like an unconscious bias and a racial attitude or, or an unconscious bias and a, and a resource allocations to whites versus blacks. So these same conflicts create these unconscious dr drivers that we might not really know that we are, you know, acting right. on as we are recruiting these subjects. We don't know. And this is why independence is important. And, and that's one of the things that really jumped out at me, Harriet, is this notion of an independent educator of our research subjects, um, you know, so that they learn the risks and benefits from an independent source and they're not learning it from the person benefiting yeah. from the research. I'm so glad you agree with that because, you know, sometimes people point their finger to the researchers, but I see it as an illogical division of labor. Why on earth would you make the person who um, has more than financial, but also, you know, professional, conflicts of interest. Um, why would you put them in that position of having and, to give objective education? Yeah, Someone absolutely. else should do that, yeah. And the other issue, you, it was the issue of the IRB, right? You know, some, we, we have a very robust IRB here at Columbia, but in some institutions, by law, you only need five members and, and one of them needs to be unaffiliated with the institution. But the other issue is that we have what we call expedited IRBs, yes. right? And during expedited IRBs, it's maybe a couple of people are involved in those situations. And so, and so I think the system, you know, you really, you really touched on it, Harriet, is just these, these flaws within the system that I think that we need to urgently deal with, um, especially in the, in, in, in the light of, of, of vulnerable patients um, who tend to be the ones that have the lowest um, uh, you know, ha you know, have the lowest empowerment um, and um, and the most likely to be exploited. Um, Harriet, let me ask you to talk about um, a couple of other specific things in the book, and uh, I'll start with the um, anthrax vaccine. Could you tell uh, that story? Yes, quite the story. Could have been a fifties science fiction novel. Um, American soldiers. Um, were forced to take experimental anthrax vaccinations. The Department of Defense had gotten a waiver from the government to force them into the research without asking their individual permission. A lot of soldiers did not want to take the vaccination, especially women. It hadn't been tested on pregnant women, and they were concerned. Um, then as the 
program continued, many soldiers fell ill, dramatically ill. And more and more soldiers began saying no. And the, and the army reacted very um, stringently, um, putting soldiers in jail, um, forcing them from the army, <laughs> with dis less than honorable discharges, taking away their pensions, um, really um, draconian pen penalties. And even um, doctors and nurses who were soldiers in the army were forced to take these. And some of the doctors and nurses began complaining about the illnesses they suffered in the af aftermath. At the same time, after this program began, we began having in this country um, terrorist um, anthrax attacks. People were finding, um, were being mailed anthrax. Um, media centers, governmental centers, uh, George Pataki's office, post office in New York. And I think at least five people died, or maybe it was seven people, a lot of people died. Others people be other became very ill with anthrax. Someone, no one knew who, who was mailing out anthrax to people, targeting government people and media people. And so the country's in a turmoil. The soldiers now really want nothing to do with the program, but they have no choice. And in the end, they found that many of the soldiers were harmed, sickened and killed. And also the program was such, um, was so hated by soldiers that enrollment in the Air Force and Army um, was depressed you know, dramatically. People stopped signing up for the Army. They didn't want to be subjected to anthrax. In the end, what we determined was the anthrax of vaccination that had been given the soldiers were um, poorly tested, um, contaminated, indeed were causing illness, and the anthrax being sent to the mail was being sent by um, a high level bio, um, a high level government biotechnic um, expert whose job it, who had actually devised the anthrax vaccine. He did it on purpose, according to the FD, FBI, because he wanted people to, when the soldiers began rejecting the vaccine, people began, the animals began turning against it. He wanted people to see that the vaccine was, was necessary and embrace it because they were afraid of getting anthrax. So now this um, government scientist, um, I name him in the book, but he committed suicide before his trial. So there's no final record to indicate his guilt, but the FBI stands by their um, claim that he was the one who, who had this, who, who devised this um, terrorist program. And what we had were like people who, um, you know, a government program that was forcing anthrax on soldiers. Now, one of the problem with doing, uh, forcing on soldiers is that Soldiers um, can be made to take medications that are approved as part of fitness for work regulations, something called the Ferris Doctrine. If you're a soldier, if you're, say you're a pilot, the army can make you take, for example, amphetamines to make you a more efficient pilot. Uh, you don't have the right to say no, but those are approved medications. It's not supposed to force unapproved medications on you. The army could only do that because they got a special waiver from the president's office to do this. After this um, fiasco was when a lot of people, especially in the military, began saying, we don't want to go through the trouble of getting a waiver every time. We want to do research without experiment, without permission. We need a uh, government um, to change the law to make it easier to conduct research without giving people, getting people's informed consent or any consent. And that's exactly what happened in 1996. Yeah, so say a little more about that. The, this is a classic case of, you know, the devil is in the details. Oh, what yeah. happened in 1996? In 1996, there was an amendation to the Code of Federal Re Regulations. It happened very quietly in the fall of 1996. I didn't find out about it till sometime afterwards. And I was shocked. And there are actually two changes. One of the changes said that if you are a trauma victim, a very wide group of people, right? Um, a lot of injuries will make you a trauma victim. Gunshot wounds, heart attacks. If you're a trauma victim, you can be forced into medical research without anyone getting your permission. The rationale was, um, never made sense to me. The rationale was that trauma victims are unconscious and therefore they're not able to give consent. And yet something urgently has to be done to save them. So we're going to um, force this uh, research on them without getting their permission. Now, one of the ways in which this was often couched, the language was, instead of treat, calling them research subjects, it would call them patients. 
And instead of talking about the um, experimental modalities as um, just that, they would call it treatments. So very suddenly, the implication was that we're treating people. We need to do this to treat people, but that's not true. Because frankly, if you were dealing with, if you have a trauma victim um, and they can't give their consent, what you should do ethically is simply treat them like you had no research study to worry about. Give them the standard of care. That's what should have been done. And yet language was suddenly used and there's a lack of opposition. You would think that medical ethicists would be concerned about this. Only a few were verbally. Jay Katz, a very important um, medical ethicist, um, uh, who passed away now. He was at Yale Medical School. He was a very important and who loudly uh, complained about how inappropriate this was, how unethical it was, how we were using groups of people as research subjects without you know, getting their um, permission. And it has like destroyed you know, something we've held secret since Nuremberg. And, um, but he was the only one, frankly. There were others who might've complained, but I couldn't find papers by them. People weren't actually listening to other people. And um, the, uh, the people I spoke to who I would have expected to be concerned about this would often dismiss it to me by saying, oh, but we use it so rarely. It doesn't happen very often, which is not an ethical defense. There's also, often, you, you, you bring this up in the book, there's a kind of opposite problem. So one problem is, uh, you know, giving treatment without consent. And another problem is withholding treatment without consent. Right. We're not we're not talking about treatment. You know, treatment is something that you um, give to a patient. And when you're a patient, you have rights you don't have as a subject. If you're a patient, you expect your doctor will uh, treat you with the thing that's um, going to be personally most helpful to you, most likely to heal you, most likely to preserve your health and wellness. But as a research subject, you can't expect that. As a subject, you're essentially there to benefit other people. They can certainly hope that it'll help benefit you as well. That often happens. But the point of the study is not to tailor care to you. The point of the study is to find something that may benefit people in the future. So um, actually they weren't, so that wasn't, wasn't a question of giving people treatment. It was couched that way. The real question was, are you going to let people become experimental subjects without telling them exactly what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Let me ask all of you, I'm sure our audience, which I can't see, is thinking about topic A, which is the pandemic and everything right. related to that. So I'd like to just throw out to all of our panelists, in, in light of Harriet's concerns about consent, how are we doing as a country and as a world um, in, in handling this pandemic? Well, I can, I can, yeah, I can start. Well, I can say that um, we, we, we made a lot of mistakes, especially in the beginning uh, of the pandemic. You know, it was, it was, um, it was like um, the end of the world for us on the front line when the pandemic hit in New York City. I was there on the front line, and um, we, we didn't know, you know, we didn't know what we were dealing with. Um, you know, we didn't even know at one stage, we weren't even sure whether we needed to wear masks or not wear masks. We didn't have enough supplies. We lacked PPEs. Um, we didn't have um, enough tests. Tests, patients were pouring in. Our emergency rooms were overflowing. People were dying all around us. A lot of us physicians, I'm a neurologist and I was, I was given a COVID unit to run. We were all converted into COVID physicians. And we were just like dealing with, it was that much, it was like the end of the world, Nicholas. And um, in that situation, we started creating ICUs all over the hospital. We had pop-up ICUs. We more than quadrupled or quintupled our ICU capacity by just converting regular units into ICUs. Uh, and, and then we had people dying all around us. I mean, there wasn't a day that we weren't seeing people die. Uh, and then we have what we call a code. Uh, where a, pa a patient stops, his heart stops beating, and then, you know, about eight of us will de de descend in the patient's room, and then we would resuscitate the patient. We would put a tube, endotracheal tube, down to support the patient's breathing, and then we would do chest compressions and, and defibrillate the patient. And and you know, we were all very exposed um, because you know it's you 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 get aerosolized the COVID. Uh, 
Uh, many of us, including myself, came down with COVID. Wow. I had a colleague that committed suicide. I mean, it was like the end of the world. It was like the end of the world. And so in that situation, we were running out of ventilators. Uh, in that situation, we, we, you know, we, we, we made some ethical mistakes, in, in my opinion. <clears throat> and, and I think Harriet really described them pretty elegantly uh, in the book. Some of those mistakes um, were related to rationing. Um, the rationing of, of ventilators, for example, you know, you have, uh, you know, a, a, an old 90 something year old individual with multiple comorbidities, maybe dementia. Um, and you have a young person who is, um, uh, who is, you know, healthy 40 young family starting off his life, and you have one ventilator, yeah, uh, one ventilator left, and you have to decide you know, or you you don't, you just give it to the person who gets there first, but they're both right there. And uh, in the emergency room, you have to put one of them on that last ventilator. And so we were faced with very challenging situations like that. Uh, and um, it was an ethical nightmare. Um, and one that, uh, you know, just our training was just insufficient to handle. Um, I don't think we get enough um, you know, bioethical training in medical school uh, and, and through our residency. Um, and, um, you know, we call it ethics consults. And, but I think there were a lot of challenges and I think a lot of mistakes were made during that time um, in terms of how uh, we, we triaged patients, how we, we rationed the supplies, um, how some, in some cases we even try to protect physicians because, you know, we were nervous about exposing uh, more of our physicians to you know, because we had a lot of people calling out and we had patients patient load going up and so it was a really hard time and and it was a scary time for us uh, because as I said it was really like we were on in a battlefield mm -hmm. and so I, I really when I was reading Harriet books um, you know it's it's, it's it, you know and it just through that retrospective lens you, you realize that there were a lot of mistakes uh, that were made and things that could could have been handled better and I think that's one of the reasons why that we really need to increase uh, training um, for physicians in this. I think everyone needs to read this book as a physician, quite frankly. I think we need to understand and anticipate, anticipate yeah. these situations because we, there's, we, we, we knew it was coming. If we really think about it, we're gonna have another yeah. pandemic. Exactly. We're gonna have another natural disaster. You know? So we knew these things would come, we weren't prepared. And as a result of that lack of preparation, there were some real uh, ethical mistakes that were made. You know, I gave this book, um, you know, this making sure people get another view of the cover. Um, <laughs> I gave this book to my daughter, who is a nursing student. Uh, and, you know, I said that I wanted her to read it and get, you know, this is my advanced copy. So I took it back from her after she read it. But, <laughs> but when it comes out, I'm going to buy, you know, her, her own copy. Um, and, you know, I also told uh, friends of mine in the medical profession about it. You have to, um, you know, you have to read this book, you know, it's, it's just kind of, you know, astounding. But it also, it reminds me, everything that we've seen uh, reminds me of a line I read once years ago that, uh, you know, nature makes hurricanes or nature makes earthquakes, but human beings make disasters. Mm. And so, you know, the disaster is the, the confluence of human decisions that interact with that natural event. And so <laughs> viruses you know, come into existence, they, they mutate, and they enter an environment, and what they do in that environment tells us everything about the decisions we made in the months, years, decades before that virus ever came into existence. And so when the, the pandemic first and the lockdowns first hit in New York, uh, I did like everyone else did. I went inside and I was in my house, you know, for days and days on end. And I would feel like I was going a little crazy. So I would sneak out in the middle of the <laughs> night and ride my bike. Uh, and riding my bike around Manhattan turned into sociology because you would hear two sounds the first was the ambulance. You know, there were just, you know, these ambulances and even more eerie was sometimes the ambulances would not have the sirens. They would just have the lights. Uh, 
Right. You know, you would see this almost parade, you know, these lights going just, in various places. They didn't places. need to warn any other cars out of there. They didn't right. need to warn any other cars. There's nobody else out. And the other sound that you would hear, where well, the sirens were on one end of the spectrum, the other sound you would hear would be so soft as to almost be imperceptible, but it was the hum of the tires of, of food messengers, you know, food delivery people. Oh. And these were all people of color. You know, some of these people were undocumented. You know, these were people from Africa. These were people from Latin America and the Caribbean. And those were the two groups that we saw being pushed to the foreground. And I said, like, how is it that we have this stark disparity? Uh, and, you know, when I rode my bike down to Times Square during the day, empty, looped around to the east side, empty, rode up to the Upper East Side, empty, came all the way back up to Harlem. I got my miles in that day, um, got all the way back up to Harlem. Harlem, it was a regular business day because people had, those were the people who had been deemed essential and that who could not get out of the way of the pandemic. And so what we're doing, like even the question of kind of how we're handling it is inextricable from the question of what we did before we ever got the pandemic. Uh, like New Orleans, you know, when we saw Katrina and what happened in Katrina mm. just reflected the decisions that people made before that. And uh, to, to Dr. Williams' point, it, the only thing that, that reminds me of that, that, that for my friends in a medical establishment, the only thing that their experiences remind me of is Sherry Fink's book, Five Days at Memorial, it's a great where book. she talks about yes. the hellscape that the doctors and nurses uh, uh, and, and staff at that hospital were plunged into as they tried to keep people alive. Uh, during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Um, Harriet, could you reflect somewhat on this pandemic with particular reference to consent? Was What kind of shape is consent in these days uh, with, with respect to our, our pandemic response? That would include treatments, vaccine development, all those things. Well, in, consent has been the first casualty, frankly. Um, and that's not unusual. Urgency is what drives um, this erosion of informed consent. That's why we saw early examples in, during wartime with soldiers, but also pandemics, because we're in situations described you know, so very well um, by Elijah Day, the fact that there simply wasn't enough, enough resources, wasn't enough knowledge. There's a great deal of fear and uncertainty. So what happened was that triage became distorted in a way that tended to um, prior prioritize survival of um, people who had the best chance of survival rather than the other way around. You know, focusing on people who had the least chance. Uh, you use the example of you know very elderly people with comorbidities, perhaps not being considered as um, as uh, much for a ventilator as other people, and then. Um, also, the administration of medications that were questionable. I mean, um, hydroxychloroquine uh, and ketamine were two medications that were largely distributed on the basis of um, President Trump's uh, conflicts of interest, relationships with his friends, with uh, companies. In fact, I believe that um, President Trump actually owned stock in um, index funds of which uh, Sanofi, the drug maker that makes hydroxychloroquine was a member. So he, he was going to profit directly from that. And as a result, it was being given to say nursing home patients by doctors who defended their failure to get uh, consent from the nursing home uh, residents' families as they should have done by saying, we don't have time for that. It's an urgent situation. Uh, one doctor said, if I called every family for permission, that's all I do all day. I'd be, only be talking on the phone to families, you know? So um, it's very, it's a lot more tempting and a bit easier to bypass consent in these emergent situations. But that, can't, that doesn't explain everything. You know, part of it was simply also a venal attitudes to our, um, treating people. Um, one of the things that's been um, suggested, which is really important, is um, looking at the causes of the of um, people's heightened 
vulnerability. When it was first found that African Americans and Native Americans and other ethnic groups um, were more likely to become infected and more likely to die, there was a plethora of blame the victim, you know, uh, rationales being proffered. Um, people saying, well, you know, you should be, you should avoid smoking and drinking and tobacco use. Um, when they talked about African Americans, very quickly you had these racialized discussions of obesity, isn't that a risk factor? And um, a lot of factors that, first of all, were not demonstrated risk factors, and second of all, simply ignored the known risk factors. Um, things like having certain underlying diabetes or living um, in proximity to environmental toxicants. You know, I wrote a piece for Nature that came out in May that pointed out that um, all the disorders caused by environmental racism were also risk factors for coronavirus infection and, and illness. But, you know, the focus on those simply wasn't proportional to the real risk. There's a lot of focus on behaviors, purported behaviors by people of color that were causing their own illness, um, purported failures. And that's what we saw too in vaccine design. During the tests, every single day, I was reading headlines and medical journal articles decrying the um, fact that African-Americans were not signing up for clinical trials every day. But when the data were collated, um, I got the original data from a um, researcher at Johns Hopkins, a very generous person who sent me the data. I saw that in the Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech trial, the same proportion of African-Americans participated, 10%. African-Americans are 12.3% of the population. So they had stepped up to the plate in proportion to their population rate. There was no failure to join in clinical trials. Why were we reading every day that there was? It's part of that blame the victim you know, mentality. And now that we're reading about African-Americans rejecting the vaccine, I ask, but you know, are there lower rates of African-Americans getting the vaccine because they're rejecting it? Or are they being separated from the vaccine? Are there policies and behaviors um, that are frankly making it less acceptable to African-Americans? To me, clearly that's the case. I'll give you just one example. If you look at age, We've looked on that as a way of prioritizing access to the vaccine, and we should. We know the elderly are more likely to become infected and more likely to uh, become more sick. But when you prioritize those over 85 years old, you're excluding people of color. African-Americans and Hispanic-Americans are all young populations. There are twice as many. The, the rate of people over 90 in this country is twice as large among whites as well as blacks. So, so by prioritizing age, we're actually operating against the interests of people of color. We need a more nuanced policy that protects both groups. And I think there are a lot of things like that that we simply are not looking at closely enough. And um, again, this um, whole dialogue about um, blame the victim factors, about African-Americans overreacting to the Tuskegee study, you know, some, some of that has been frankly disproven and yet it's still, is the narrative that we're reading every single day unchallenged. Can, can, I, like, um, right. can I add really quickly one thing uh, that the vaccine hesitancy among African-Americans is still lower than the vaccine hesitancy among uh, specific groups like Trump voters. Right. Um, They're and, at 50%, right? Right. <laughs> but it doesn't yeah. explain, it doesn't explain the lag. Uh, and so people have said the same thing uh, in, in New York City, you know, de, de Blasio, and the leadership here have you know talked about the same thing you know for the small number of Hispanics who've been uh, vaccinated, and they're saying, oh well, this hesitancy, these people don't trust us. First, if they didn't trust, there'd be good reason. But the other thing is that you know, have you gone on Spanish language radio? Have you put up billboards uh, in these communities in English and Spanish? Uh, are you connected with the the clergy? Yeah. You know, in New York, I was like, have you all uh, gone on black radio? Have you, there's a whole array of these avenues. Are you talking to the social media influencers? Yeah. You know, basically are you doing outreach? And yeah. so it's become a kind of vicious cycle where the wrongs of history are being cited as a means of enabling more wrongs in the present. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I want to say a couple of things because um, you know I'm, I I I sit on the vaccine committee for the university, uh, 
So a couple of things I just want to say. One is that um, that there I, I agree in in the misrepresentate with the misrepresentation, and I also agree that you know it's it's an it's an information and approach uh, gap, right? So if we have as Jelani mentioned, if we have the right approach, the right you know, going, meeting folks where they are, using uh, uh, trusted messengers, clergy, for example, um, and uh, having, uh, you know, more people of color advocate um, for vaccines, uh, providing the data and uh, on the safety uh, in a way, in a, in a format that's, that's uh, you know, tailored to that community. Um, you know, all of these, this, this information, the problem with public health, and, and I do a lot of work in public health is we have a communication problem with communities of color. But the way we design these messages, we design them, uh, you know, not for communities of color. You can't have, you know, a group of, 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 of you know, white families, um, you know, you know e doing things uh, and showing things that are really not um, that that are foreign to uh, a, 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 a black family who you know might be you know struggling to put food on the table, for example. So so you need to you need to tailor your messages. We we call it cultural tailoring. We use cultural adaptation frameworks to tailor messages to particular communities. You could be tailoring it to to uh, the Hispanic community. You might really require language, the Native American community. And so one of the things that we haven't done very well in public health is culturally tailor these messages so that they resonate with these communities. And when we, then we, when we don't do that, we now say, hey, they don't get it. Hey, they don't want it. Hey, they're not interested in it. It's because we haven't spoken to these groups in a, in a way that they would understand and in a way that's engaging uh, in where they are and meeting them where they are. So that's one thing I wanna say. The other thing really quickly, is, enough, is with regards to access. Access is a huge problem right now because you know, we can, we, people can want to get the vaccine, but if you can't access the vaccine because of all the barriers uh, in your way, then you're gonna have disproportionate coverage with one, in one neighborhood versus the other. And, and the truth is in marginalized neighborhoods, Access is not just, it's, it's, this isn't a COVID problem. I tell, I tell people that this isn't a COVID problem. These problems that we're seeing with COVID, I've been dealing with for 20 years as a physician and as a health disparities physician. These are problems that you could just take COVID away, put heart disease on it, put diabetes on it, put um, stroke on it. These are systemic problems that COVID has just exposed a certain group of people because COVID is just much more, um, it, it, it's, a, it's closer to them than a lot of these other. So this is an, an, a fundamental problem uh, with social determinants of health uh, that's been driven by the larger issue of structural racism that has marginalized certain people from healthcare access, from quality of that access, and from even the, the type of the, the, the type of health coverage that they need to really live. And then you see the, 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 the environmental context as well that drives all these conditions. So, so again, yes, we're talking about COVID, but there are deeper fundamental structural issues here that COVID is exposing that we need to seize in the moment and begin addressing them. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's a really good point. Um, a long time ago, 20 years ago, as a matter of fact, I was um, a fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health in their health communication section. And one of the things I realized then was that social marketing of the kind you describe is really important, essential, but it's not enough. One of the problems and the way we communicate with people of color is that is problematic, and I think that's coming to a head now, is that when we do have people resistant to trusting the system, we interrogate their behavior. You know, well, you're avoiding some Tuskegee. Well, we know it's not true. Thomas Levis did studies at Hopkins years ago showing that people who had never heard of Tuskegee were more afraid of medical research than people who had. So we know that's not true. But um, the fact is that there are fears there that are uh, linked to more contemporary uh, events. 
contemporary events that get very little attention so that when people um, bring them up or express their fears of them, they're dismissed as conspiracy theories, right? Um, I mean, really dramatic things have happened in this country, like the CIA conducted sham polio vaccine studies in the developing world. You know, there weren't really polio vaccinations, but they were trying to find Osama bin Laden. They were taking people's uh, DNA samples under the guise of vaccinating them. And then when they got what they needed, they left. Afterwards, people who were doing real polio vaccinations were driven from countries. Um, their access was barred and seven people trying to vaccinate others were killed in the developing world because they were suspected of being CIA operatives. This actually happened. In fact, the heads of several schools of public health wrote to protest the government to protest about doing this. And so, but yet this doesn't become part of the discussion. And when you hear people who have learned about this, perhaps from reading uh, papers like The Final Call, the Muslim newspaper, they might've read about it there. When they bring it up, someone says, oh, conspiracy theory. It sounds too absurd to have happened, but it, guess what? It didn't happen. And there've been a lot of problems with vaccine studies in the developing world that have gotten the attention of many African-Americans here, but haven't been well publicized. So many whites may not know about them. It's something mm -hmm. else we have to take consideration when we're doing our uh, communication and social marketing. Can I add one thing? I know we're like right at time, but I want to say <laughs> something I think is important that's also part of this conversation, which is the, the actual experiences that people have interacting with the medical establishment. Like to, to Harriet's point, it doesn't have to be historical. Right. I have conversations with my peers across uh, all sorts of socioeconomic and educational backgrounds. And they talk about being uh, dismissed or, or treated uh, poorly by physicians. Uh, and so there's something which I'm ashamed of, but I'll say that because I think it's important to bring up. Anytime I go to a new doctor for any reason, I slip into the conversation, the fact that I write for the New Yorker. <laughs> and it's, I don't blame you. <laughs> but it is like, it's a, it's a mechanism yeah. to you say. Know, Jelani, you know, Jelani, what you're saying is there's a report that was uh, commissioned by Congress. Called, it's the Institute of Medicine report. Um, and it's a very famous report that chronicles all the research around physician bias. And what you're, what you're saying is true. There's a tremendous amount of unconscious bias among providers. And uh, look, you know, I'm a physician. I've seen it even among my colleagues, I'm afraid to say. And there's a tremendous amount of unconscious bias among physicians across this country. And the evidence of that was well documented in the Institute of Medicine report. And the, the dangers of it was well documented. And it ranges from uh, an African-American uh, patient not getting adequate pain control all the way through to an African-American patient not getting a right procedure. And it's, it's, it's there and it's been shown that these physician biases influence, uh, actually have an impact on mortality and morbidity among Blacks. So it's a real phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon. I have to uh, call time on this <laughs> event, unfortunately. We, we obviously could go on longer but we're at the time we promised to end. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks to all of you in the audience for coming. If you're interested in Harriet's book in particular or other books that we're publishing, all of which are great, go to uh, globalreports.columbia.edu and you can uh, order Harriet's book there. So thanks everybody. And um, I hope this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Have a great night.